everyone to our first talk on Sunday. Uh, first, a word from our sponsor, uh, Los Angeles Sea. This is Open Sousa. Uh, Open Sousa is proud to sponsor Scale, the presenter you will hear from today. Use your Open QA for a fully automated testing framework and for big data. One click install um, with Open Sousa Factory. You can use OpenStack, R, Ceph, Redis, IPython, and uh, more. Uh, all available with OpenSUSE. Hack with us and build big data around OpenSUSE, which is based on the same technologies that SUSE uses. Um, our first talk today, uh, it's Don Marty presenting Showing Off Your Software with a Great Demo System. Oh, also on the back of your uh, um, badges and also in your uh, program, you'll see a link for our uh, speaker survey. When you have a chance, please share your opinions with us. All right, thank you very much. Um, I uh, appreciate OpenSUSE, especially for the build service. I don't actually run OpenSUSE myself, but the build service that they run for uh, a lot of different packages is very useful. Um, so I'm here to talk about showing off your software with a great demo system. And I'm actually not going to be doing a live demo here. I'm going to be talking about demos. So if that's too meta for you, then there's a container talk across the hall where I think everyone is right now. So a um, couple uh, points of order. Um, every time you make, oh, come on, it's chopped off my uh, slide here. OK. Um, every time you make a PowerPoint, Edward Tufte kills a kitten. So this is not uh, a conventional presentation package. This is something that I uh, uh, put together in JavaScript, so bear with me on the the next step of uh, of the um, the thing. Uh, this is off message uh, for my day job. I do cloud computing um, uh, stuff, which is very professional, and the slides look completely different. And is there any way to get this? What's that? Yeah, that's that's actually, yeah, yeah, okay. So this is this is off. Oh, no, this is this is this is meta. This is not an actual demo. This is talking about some ideas for things to uh, to use for demos in the future. All right, so um, that is real bad. Um, and yes, I did come in and and uh, and check this before I came. But all right, so I can just talk about stuff. Um, one more thing: if you have any questions, please just raise your hand. Um, don't save questions till the end. Um, all right, that's better. Um, this is uh, a kitten who's alive. I'm not using PowerPoint. All right. The big problem that we have with doing a demo of new software is do you want the new demo or do you want the working demo? So you've got a brand new feature that somebody's put together. They've showed it to you. The developers of the software can get this thing to build. They can show it off. But by the time you've got to the point where you're taking it to a trade show, taking it to a customer, doing an online meeting with it, you're not quite ready to take this thing and actually demo it. So what you really um, hope you could get is a demo that includes the new features and is also something that you can do reliably and that works. How do we make that work? I think there are five levels of demos, uh, five levels of software quality. This is kind of like what Rusty Russell came up with for APIs, uh, but I think that this applies to demos too. Um, level one, nobody can do the demo. This is pretty often. This is software that's in development. Uh, level two, the developers can demo when they're available. Um, level three, a few key people can do it. 
Level four, any interested and motivated people can do the demo. And five, anyone can do it. Now five is what a lot of the software as a service sites have where you can go and see tour our product online. That's pushing it to the extreme where you um, um, you may want to be for that type of a, of a software project. But uh, what I would really like to do is move my demos from at least a level two up to a level four. All right, so the big problem when we're doing demos of new software is that all the meta stuff, the instructions for how to do it, uh, the documentation of how you actually make this thing work, um, anything that an administrator needs to focus on is not all there yet at the time that the thing itself is working and you're ready to show it off. So the problem is we need to demo it anyway. And All right. So this is a typical perception of the quality of most demo machines. Demo machines are often in a state where you've got specific stuff that's on them that has to be set up a certain way. If you forget to do something, the demo will break. You're only demoing an older, stable version of the software, and um, it is a wretched hive of scum and villainy. Uh, what can you do to make it work a little better? Well, I think that the way to approach it is to start treating a software demo as a software project. So you've got the people who are on the project who are demoing, who are, who are developing the original software, and then there's your project in parallel, which is the demo. And the demo is itself a software project. And so you think, oh, great. We get to do all these daily stand-up meetings, and we get to have a big board that's covered with cards and stuff. We can do all this software development jive around putting a demo together. Well, actually, we don't have to do that. We just have to get a couple basic uh, items together. We need to have some form of bug tracking. We need to have some kind of uh, repeatable build. And why are these two items out of the uh, huge array of things that people do for um, software projects, why are these two things important for doing a demo package? Well, bug tracking Every time you do the demo, people are going to come in with suggestions and questions and say, why doesn't this work? Who, um, who would actually want this thing? Um, I don't understand. Um, or you find yourself doing an extra step manually in the demo that breaks the flow of it. So you need a lightweight system that will let you capture, here's what's wrong with my demo, here's what I want to do about it next time. So use a simple bug tracker. Second thing is repeatable build. It's not a production system. Why do you need to do all this kind of DevOpsy um, uh, script everything to just make your demo work? Well, that goes back to the problem of tracking the new versions as they're being built. You want to be able to do the good demo of the current software. Um, the question is for um, keeping your demo project organized, do you want to have the demo material live in the project repo it, with the source code of the, of the actual product you're demonstrating? Or do you want to have your demo stuff live in its own separate repo? And that really depends on the organization of the project. If you have uh, a role in the project that lets you modify things like documentation that if the project has a subdirectory called util, you can go in and make little utility scripts, then by all means, make the demo stuff part of the software. Put it in so that 
um, people who want to do a self-serve demo don't have to check out two things. Now, if you're in a more corporate environment where you've got Fortress Engineering in the middle and then marketing support all the other organizations are sort of rings around that, then there's no way that the core development team is going to let you put your development, your, your demo scripts and your notes and your all your demo jive into their precious repository. So in that case, you have to go out to get your own repository. And this is a place where doing a, a GitHub private repo is really handy, because that gives you a basic bug tracker, um, and it gives you a system that will um, let you easily track all your, your scripts and, and sample content and so on. Um, GitHub, so there's there's a site called GitHub, yeah, and they have a um, they have public repositories that you can start for open source projects. If you're doing something for work that's a confidential thing, then you can make that a private repo on GitHub, and that is sort of the uh, GitHub private repos are a great secret weapon for technical marketing because it's a thing that you can do as a person who's not part of Fortress Engineering but still get uh, um, most or all of the power of what your uh, what your core development team has. Now the company I work for we have all our stuff on GitHub to start with um, but if you're in a in a different type of organization you can you can use um, GitHub, or if you want to host it yourself, there's a very similar package called GitLab um, to keep track of your your miscellaneous small projects. Right. Thanks. That's a that's a good question. Any more uh, questions? Please let me know. All right. So the bug tracking system for the software you're demoing, you should be an active user of that. If you're putting a demo together and something doesn't work right in your demo, file a bug on the software you're demoing as early as you can. If they close it out and say, this is not a bug, this is the way it's supposed to work, well, that means you have to redo your demo. And the earlier you know this, the faster you'll be able to get your demo script together um, and you won't have to assume, well, I'm going to demo this thing, but they'll fix this this bug before I actually have to go to the big trade show and show this off. So, it when in doubt, if you're responsible for doing a demo of something, spam the developers with bug reports. All right, use the latest source, figure out a way to track the the software you're demoing. I mentioned this before. You have to report bugs um, when you're doing uh, the new stuff. And uh, if you are reporting bugs, they'll tell you, oh, it's fixed in the new version. So it's sort of a feedback loop. You use the new stuff. You file more bugs. You file more bugs. They tell you to use the new stuff. So you get a positive feedback loop between your demo in progress and the software in progress, you become, uh, the, in effect, the customer uh, or the representative of the customer that the, the developers are listening to when you're putting your demo together. And that means unicorns and rainbows for all. Okay. Not quite, but it's way closer to solving that problem that we talked about at the beginning of the working demo versus the demo that has the cool new stuff in it. All right, so I, I can definitely leave people with one quick tip, which you aren't, if you aren't already doing it, will make the whole thing worthwhile. So that is controlled environment. Keep as much as you can, um, as much under control as you can. Uh, you're not going to want to have a lot of uh, extra stuff going on, so make a local user on your laptop called Demo. 
add user demo. It's not, uh, it's not a big deal. It'll take you five minutes. That user will have a clean bash RC. That user will not have weird stuff in their path. Um, that user will not have things in their shell history that you might not want to see. Um, they won't have uh, stuff in their home directory. Make a demo user uh, on the system for yourself. Uh, for your browser, um, the, the, the concept of using your real web browser to do a software demo is one of the most lulls inducing um, trends in information technology. The combination of real browser history, real human typing under stress, um, and browsers that autocomplete URLs, use your imagination, um, and then get uh, Firefox uh, user profile set up. Uh, default can be yourself and then one for demo and you're good. You may want to make more than one demo profile depending on how much stuff you're demoing, um, but at least have a profile that's called demo. So if you have an opportunity to demo your software, you just do this get the profile manager up, um, launch your demo profile, uh, and you can focus on the demo rather than whatever all other all stuff you had on your, uh, uh, on your browser. This is also, uh, yes? Oh, yes. Okay, that's good. That's good. And when you're doing the multi-user demo, um, uh, Firefox has this concept of user persona, where you can decorate your windows differently. Um, and there's a similar um, but more understated and, and classier looking option for Google Chrome. You definitely want to make different um, personas, different different browser themes for your multiple users. And I like to have a little fun with it. I like to have a really corporate looking one and then I pick like a goth one and a Hello Kitty one uh, to say these are, to make it really clear that these are two different users uh, interacting with the same system. So yes, that's a, that's a really good point. And um, the, the one I use sometimes is, it's called Hello Kitty in the Pink Park and it, it really shows this is a separate uh, user that's not our, uh, our main user. So. All right. So that's kind of the superficial stuff, but now we get into the hard part of how do we actually keep track of and install and configure the demo management or the, the, the software and all the dependencies and all the stuff for the demo. We need some kind of a demo management system. And a good demo management system will let us install everything consistently every time. It will check that everything we depend on to do the demo is there, and stuff that might mess up the demo is not there. Um, a good demo management system will let us do scripted actions when we install and uninstall things, like adding stuff to the path, setting up cron jobs, whatever. We've got, we've got to have some scripted actions when we set up the software to be demoed. Uh, the demo data itself has to be brought in. If we're demoing something where users have to be able to manipulate pictures or videos or audio, we have to be able to, to reliably put that in the same place on the system. Um, we need to install helper scripts. Nobody wants, to you, nobody wants to see a demo of you typing all the commands needed to start multiple complex pieces of software. They want to see it's doing its thing. So your demo management system has to give you a helper script that will let you bring up a nice demo environment. Um, and a demo management system will enforce some sanity checks. 
It won't install stuff with broken permissions. Oh, and it should put everything in the cloud because cloud. So this sounds like a, a pretty complicated piece of software that needs to be done. Let's let's build one of these. Should start a, a whole new software company to develop uh, demo management uh, software. We could we could get a nice. Uh, Nice website. Go out and have hackathons with sushi and stuff. It'd be awesome. Um, but or or I know we could do it with Puppet. Anyone seen the site, the Doom that came to Puppet? They took the Puppet documentation and the works of H.P. Lovecraft and fed them into a Markov chain and uh, came up with some explanations of of configuration management that actually make more sense than uh, than is really good. Puppet can also be used to demonstrate things here, but it is not wholesome to watch monstrous objects doing what one had known only human beings to do. So, configuration management systems are great for doing their thing, but they're they're complicated and they're somewhat overkill for doing the demo deployment. It looks like we still need a demo management solution. Right? Is there an easier way to do it? I'm going to say there is. And you probably already have it. And it's called RPM. Think about it. It's got dependencies. It's got clean uninstall. It's got clean installs and uninstalls with scripts. It's got the ability to do your repositories in the cloud. It's got a bunch of nice tools around it for sanity checking. So you don't have to be a Linux distribution maintainer to get some value out of an RPM for um, just building demo software. Now, who's built uh, RPMs before? OK. All right, uh, Debian packages. Okay, so this is good. I didn't turn this into a tutorial on how to do RPM. Um, this is more material on which features of, of uh, RPM are useful for demos and things that you want to do for making demo RPMs. So de RPMs are um, relatively easy to make. You can drive the building of multiple RPM packages from one spec file. Um, and you can include multiple sources of software. Um, so when you're not building for distribution, you have the option of, uh, of building packages in a non-distribution uh, friendly way. So Spot from the Fedora project is not here. So I can say, go ahead and define RPM build to be um, RPM build with popdir is your current working directory slash build. Uh, you can make RPMs that are prefixed with your company project name. Uh, you can make RPMs that install things into ops. Yes, RPM will complain about this, but you're making uh, RPMs for your demo. So if you're not using ops for anything else, you can stick demo stuff in ops. Um, and you can actually just make RPMs out of make. So you can stick uh, targets into a make file to create RPMs. And I found that th this was actually a, a pretty useful way to drive it. Um, type make once and you get the, the right RPMs for the project. So the problem though is we're tracking our upstream versions, right? We're seeing what's the new wild and woolly stuff from the developers and we're um, building that into our demo. So we don't have a uh, tar file or a complete software release archive off. We've just got access to a version control system. So in this case, we need to use git archive. Um, and so, so you can just say git archive head, tell it to put it in a tar format. Uh, stick the prefix of the name of the project on there. This is just a, a small project that I have that happened to be a good example. Um, and then 
spew it out to um, a tar archive. Uh, you can also put in, um, instead of head, you can use a particular tag. Uh, so if you want to do a demo that's key to a particular particular release, uh, there's a, and there's a tag for it, uh, you can do that. You can you can demo off a branch. You've got a lot of possibilities once you start uh, doing it straight out of Git. Um, another thing to do in um, demo RPMs is don't be afraid to stick a whole bunch of conflicts in there, even if it doesn't actually conflict. Remember, controlled environment. If, if you're not sure if something is going to break your demo system, then you don't have time to test all the different combinations. You don't want to say, well, it'll probably work if the user's running their own mail server on localhost. You just want to say, conflict that thing out. So make the conflict lines for everything that might give you grief in your demo uh, and reduce your uncertainty. Now, you don't want to stick all of your demo stuff into a single RPM. Um, you, the, the way to make it work is to have a um, tree of dependencies of RPMs for demos. And you start with one that's just whatever your project is, dash base. Everything depends on that. This gives you an easy way to blow everything away and start over. You don't have to um, do a yum remove on whatever all uh, packages uh, you've installed. You make everything depend on base. Uh, you can stick any common stuff that needs to be uh, the same across multiple demos into that base package. Now, for each piece of software you're, you're demoing, that would have um, its own RPM. And at this level, is where you put in the dependencies for the software itself. So if it's a web application, you have it depend on the web server you're testing with and so on. Um, and those RPMs are the closest to regular in the wild uh, RPMs that, that uh, you're going to deal with for, for demos. Third, the data files. Every logical set of data files that goes into um, a demo should be its own RPM. Now, you don't need to break it up super fine. If you've got something that involves um, uploading text from the user, you might have a directory full of multiple articles that will, that will sit in an RPM. Or you might have an RPM that includes a bunch of article text and a bunch of photos and some audio clips. Whatever the logical unit of here's the demo data for my particular demo, uh, make that into its own RPM. Um, and then finally, the top level RPM, the one that depends on all of these, it'll depend on the data files and the software RPMs, uh, and the data files and the software RPMs will depend on base. Uh, the final top level RPM is just name of project dash demo. In that RPM, that's all uh, documentation stuff and helper scripts for setup and teardown. So you install project dash demo, that comes back, you know all the software's there, you know all the data. So any questions on RPM dependency schemes? Great. Uh, the base package, this is really important for uninstalling to clean up. Um, and then finally, you want to be able to stick the whole thing into not just uh, bare RPMs, but you want to put it into a real uh, YUM repository that you can install with YUM. Uh, and so here, you're going to uh, sign the RPMs uh, with the GNU Privacy Guard. This is using the, the resign command. Uh, you're going to create repo that builds all the repo metadata. Um, stick an HD access file in there as needed, a README file, um, and then just upload it to the host where everything's going to live. Uh, this makes it all live in the cloud, so no matter where your demo machine is being installed from, uh, it can can grab those those RPMs. Now. Justifying this, though, you 
come in and say, well, I'm going to put some extra time into this demo, and I'm going to make it all using, and then everybody's waiting. What's the cool thing you're going to use? Okay. You do it all with RPM. And RPM, that's, that's old. That's like, what about, what about doing it with Docker? Well, Docker is great, and once you've done the RPMs, you've done 99% of the work of making it run in Docker. So you want it in Docker? Just make a short Docker file that drops your um, repo into your uh, into your YUM configuration directory and does the installation. You use you use Docker as a wrapper around RPM. So why go to all the trouble of doing RPM instead of just doing bare Docker to begin with? Well, because RPM has sanity checking tools like RPM Lens so that you can make sure you've done everything right, it's all the right permissions, you haven't built a file that you didn't install, all the things that people have gotten wrong in 20 years of building Linux distributions have been added to RPM and RPM Lint, and so you get all that for free, and then you wrap the Docker coolness around it, and what's not to like? Okay. So, one option is you put it in a container. Um, another option is, well, what if you have some people who are doing your demo, sales engineers carrying their shiny MacBooks around who just want it on a virtual machine? You can give them a unikernel-based demo where everything lives in a bare VM. Instead of having a Linux virtual machine that you then install packages on or that you then install containers on, uh, you can have a virtual machine that is stripped down to the point of running just one piece of software. Now remember what I said about constraining the environment, about e eliminating unpredictability for doing software demos. If your software will run on a unikernel, then that's the ultimate in doing this. There are no local users. There are no local config files. There's no extra stuff running that could conflict with the thing that you're trying to demo. Um, so the OSV unikernel is POSIX compatible. You can run one um, application on it at a time. And the only catch is you can't do a fork. Because it's a unikernel, there's a single address space, you can't go start up multiple processes. So if you're thinking about, oh, I'm going to demo my PHP-based web CMS that fires off a copy of ImageMagick to change all the photos that the users upload, well, no, for that you're going to have to use Linux. If you have a regular Java application or a server application that's written to the POSIX API, then that thing, you can easily build it and deliver it as a single demo VM that is probably the hardest uh, demo tool to mess up. Um, Docker has a simple config file called Dockerfile. Um, Capstan um, has essentially the same uh, config file format. You say the base uh, image the base unikernel image that you want to uh, install. You give it the uh, command line, um, what the program is that's going to run uh, for that uh, for that image. Uh, you say how to build it, um, and then you just list the files that you drop in. And Capstan will also let you uh, simply install an RPM as well. Now, Russ, can you um, uh, tell us a little bit about your talk? So, unikernels are not for every software demo, but for certain types of applications, they're the fastest way to get things built, and for some 
application, you can actually get your complete VM image small enough to fit in under your GitHub quota so you don't have to worry about uh, where to put your VM. Um, I worked on one project where we had to FedEx an external hard drive from one location to another because that was the only place where the demo was set up correctly. With uh, a demo that's built out on a unikernel, you can stick it on GitHub. With a demo that's built on a simple Linux distribution, you can have your demo on a USB key. So the closer to right you get your demo, the closer to repeatable you get your demo, the fewer international FedEx shipments you have to do to do uh, uh, transfer demo machines from one place to another. All right, I mentioned the concept of um, of helper scripts, and helper script is just going to do any sanity check to set up the demo, start any servers that need to be running, uh, clean any cleanup that has to happen uh, will be done in the helper script, um, and then you have a, a script that uh, you can run again to set it up again. Um, ideally, you build these scripts so that they're uh, idempotent, which is a word that I learned from um, the H from reading about HTTP GET. You run it once, and then you run it again, and it gives you the same result. No matter how many times you do demo setup, you get the same demo setup. Uh, the script should also have meaningful error messages. Uh, you should give the script a name that is unique, that doesn't conflict with any other uh, package on th any other uh, uh, tool on the system, um, and you should have a package uh, that'll do. Um, that you should have a demo package that adds your um, scripts, uh, your helper scripts to uh, your path, or at least to uh, the demo user's path. So. Um, basically, these have to be good quality shell scripts because they're not just going to be run by you or by cron. Uh, these scripts will be run by people giving the demo um, under uh, uh, hot lights on stage, and they um, have to just work. Or if they fail, tell the user what to do to fix it. Um, now, there is, um, this is what's, what's kind of confusing is there are helper scripts for a demo, and then there's a document called the demo script, which is a script as in a thing for humans to read rather than a script thing for the computer to execute. So the demo script is the document that you would give to people who are going to give the demo. Um, it starts off as uh, your original notes for here's how I'm going to go through this demo, and then gradually it gets more filled out so that you can share it with other people. And the demo script needs to contain um, at least uh, four parts. One, documentation for how to set up the demo. This should be just yum install and then the name of your demo package. There should be documentation for cleaning up and restarting, and that is just a one-line run your helper script. The script itself will have documentation on here's what the script does, set up the demo, but you want to give people the minimum demo administration that they have to do so that they can focus on <coughs> explaining the value of what the software does. Second, <coughs> the demo script has to be built around a cool story. This can actually be completely lifted from some of your best user stories from the development process. So if you, f you see some of the high priority stories that were up on the Agile board when the, the engineering team was doing their development of the software, you can say, aha, that's a high priority story, that's an important thing to our users, that's something that we need to capture for the demo. So you lift those those stories, you build them into a coherent story of here's something that the user's actually doing. 
and it needs to be reasonable, it needs to be a cool story, bro, um, and it needs to um, be something where if something goes wrong, you're still telling the story and people are focused on, on the value that the software does. They're not confused of, oh, he's clicking the pink button and it's not doing anything. You need, you need to explain why you're doing something valuable and what the user's motivation is in the story um, rather than just, um, here's what we do here, here's what we do. Um, the demo script also needs to uh, cover what the locally installed content is. When you have a story around uh, a piece of text or an image that the user's working with, you say, this is our image, and then you put in the file name for the image, and then you say, this is our uh, picture of Johnny on the slide, or whatever the, the whatever the, the content is. You explain what the content is. Um, and then you have some extra stories that you can use if uh, the user that you're demoing to is really interested and they ask a question. You can jump over to another story and hopefully show them something that's fairly close to what they asked about. All right. Um, who knows what this building is? There you go. All right, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, there you go. All right. Now, practicing a demo isn't just about doing the same practice over and over. You have to practice from a clean install, start with a demo machine that didn't have anything on it, and you just do your documented install steps. Uh, practice from a messed up install, so remove your stuff and um, install and start over, and practice offline. Conference networks are, except for scale, of course, uh, conference networks can be unpredictable. All right, so um, something that's coming soon uh, from, oh, yes, question. Yes. Exactly, exactly. You have to be able to install your server side stuff on your local host. So when you build your application that you're demoing, your web application that you're demoing, you have that depend on the web server package for the distribution that you're using. And you have it drop in all the web content, um, all the, the executables, everything that needs to be there for that application to run. Then, as demo user, you can go to localhost slash my cool application or whatever, and you know it's there. So, um, this, ah, uh, yes, question. Absolutely. Always be able to run your demo off of localhost. If you yes, yes. If you if you can't do your demo on localhost, you're dramatically restricted in the situations where you can do your demo, and it's possible that more that and, and more and more things can be unpredictable about your demo. So, for example, you might be demoing at a customer site and they've got a video conference to their system administration team in Atlanta. Now, your soft your browser is trying to hit your server out on the internet somewhere. Um, this web conferencing thing is trying to do its stuff on the internet, and your software looks really slow when the people on the other end of the connection are talking. So you build everything out on localhost and point your browser at it. Everything goes fast, and everything looks better. Uh, yes, Rob?
that's that's good and I I understand that advice um, I I respectfully have to disagree and I think I'll get to that in a couple more slides so the the fallback the fallback video is is definitely a thing though uh, yes And making a quality demo of new software is on the ragged edge of software QA. If you're, if you're building a good demo of new features, you will run into bugs, and you do have to put on your QA hat and file them and help the developers fix them. The demo should be there as early as possible after the software is, and that means practicing the demo while the software still isn't ready. That means working with bleeding edge code, and it means hitting bugs and fixing bugs. There's no other way to deal with it. All right, so C Star, this is a new project. It is a, a really fast C library. It's at cstarproject.org. Uh, we are now at level two. Uh, the developers can make this thing work. Um, Hello World is coming along. And if you want to watch some um, demo stuff being built live on the internet with actual mistakes, uh, check out uh, cstarproject.org. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll see if we can uh, uh, get this thing into a demoable state at least by the next uh, scale. So, uh, yes. Absolutely. And any any setup like that needs to go into the demo script. Exactly. Oh yeah, yeah. And and that's why you should kill your own browser, kill your own um, kill your own session entirely, um, if if it's practical for you, and do that as the user demo because the user demo does not have the email password for me. It doesn't have my any of my my passwords for things that could notify me. So um, switch over to an X session that's running as demo. Switch over to a browser that's running as demo. Uh, don't do it with uh, your own um, complete desktop uh, there. And yes. Yeah, and if you are if you are demoing something um, remote, don't use your own account. Have a demo account. Ideally, you'd get your um, running copy of the server um, to a point where you can um, install the demo user's clean state at the beginning of the demo. Um, cleaning up demo state is really important for something like a trade show demo, where you're going to be showing the software off to somebody, and then some knucklehead comes up and types in a bunch of crap. You want to be able to reset it quickly, um, have everything in a pristine state um, before the next user comes along and, and sees whatever somebody else typed. It's usually not going to be something completely asinine, but it's probably not going to make your application look um, uh, its best. Right, so C Star coming along. There will be uh, demo code for this shortly. All right, I would like to thank the Creative Commons photographers for the pictures: the kitten, the unicorn, and Carnegie Hall. All right.
Uh, further reference, um, this um, this talk just actually happened in Europe like uh, last week. Um, talk called RPM Building 101 uh, captures some of the modern uh, wisdom in how to make RPM buildings uh, productive and joyful. Uh, check it out. All right. And I just want to leave everyone with a closing thought. Always do a live demo. Broken demos are scary. Software that can't be demoed is scary. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any more questions? Oh, yes. downtime to do it and check it. Um, I actually recommend both because if you're packing up after doing the demo for a customer, you can always do your uh, cleanup. Um, if you somehow get sucked into a thing or a discussion and you don't have time to do your cleanup, then you still want to make sure that it's clean. So do it um, offline um, before you go into your next demo. Uh, but I would I would say the setup script should be it impotent, so you can run it as many times as you want, and run it as a matter of habit when you're done with the demo. Run it as a matter of habit when you're offline uh, logging out your demo user, um, and then run it before you go into a new demo. So, ah, uh, yes, question in the back. In a startup, this stuff is typically done by uh, first by one of the founders and second by the first marketing person who gets hired. Um, and then when the company gets a little bigger, then there will be a small marketing department where there's someone who's, quote, product marketing or um, technical marketing who does it. Uh, or it's possible that the person who does this kind of thing would have the title uh, sales engineer. So depending on the size of the company, it can be anybody from the CEO to a special purpose demo monkey who reports to the director of sales engineering. Uh, yes? demo script needs to be a really solid bulletproof script. So everything you've learned about how to do shell scripts in a sanitary way, um, apply that to that script because the person who's running it may be unfamiliar with it. It may be a new um, contributor in, in an open source situation um, and they definitely won't have a lot of time to to debug it. So that, that script needs to be as helpfully written as possible and do all the cleanup and sanity checking that it can. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, one one time I did this kind of thing and took it to a trade show, and the rest of the staff of, of the booth who were dealing with this said, this is really great, and they started pointing out the fact that this all this software is packaged in this way with the tree of dependencies and everything. Um, and I actually got um, sort of transferred over to the product group to do the packaging for the production version of the product based on having had to do it for a demo. So there's a there's there's a line between what's part of the product and what's part of the demo. And depending on how the product is set up and how difficult it is to do and how the organization is set up, you're going to have different mixes of this part over here is product, this part over here is demo. Uh, yes. good. The easier it is to reset state to where your your user story starts, then the more time you can spend explaining, here's how you use it, here's the benefit a person gets from it, and the less time you have to spend on setup. Oh, yes. And the demo, the demo can you can think of the demo itself as a software project in itself. And once you start thinking of it that way, where the demo has bugs or the demo has uh, commits, then it helps you get it organized and have it more likely that it'll it'll complete correctly. Oh yeah. And that's where you have to develop the story of something useful that the person can do with the software. And you can say, this feature doesn't work yet. Um, uh, you can say, well, the save to cloud button doesn't work. But let's say Joe wants to put it on a USB key. So you click download, and, and you do a different version of the story that includes something meaningful. And how much you want to talk about future things and how much you want to focus on the story that that depends on on the story you want to tell um, I would focus on telling the story of something that works now and um, save the future features for talking about after the demo <laughs> well, well, Russ says make a video, make a video of uh, of doing it correctly. Um, I think that you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, that's good. That's good. Yeah. So the thing to watch out for is 
when an old video or old documentation has more Google juice than the new version. Um, that's a place where you ha definitely have to coordinate with your webmaster on um, prominently linking people who are searching for the new thing over to the new thing. All right. Well, thank you all very much for coming.